Right, I've got um, 30 minutes, I've got 60 slides, so I'm not going to hang about. Uh, I was going to say, I was going to take some out, but they're all so exciting. Right, so it's BAFTA, so I thought I'd do a little bit of a movie theme to it. Um, so uh, these are the four sections I'm going to do. Uh, all got N-words, so we've got, excuse the phrase, uh, so we've got now, the near, the next, and the neo, so this is what we're doing now, this is what's kind of close, but we're not really doing at the moment, kind of availing other areas of the, the industry. Uh, next is kind of the, the cool stuff, it's probably illegal, uh, but... Yeah, we look at it. Uh, Nick's going to have a field day with me ne later when he does the legal stuff. Um, and then Neo, which is sort of the matrix. So, it's, you know, red pill, blue pill, how far do you want to go down that rabbit hole? So, currently, this is kind of where we are at the moment. So, things we should be doing out of home, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm from a technical background, a creative background. So, really good um, use of weather. Uh, McDonald's, this was in uh, Whistler. Um, equating the, uh, the snowfall to their products. So, if there's 10 cent 11 centimetres of snow, then it's clearly going to be the the frappa latte with a whippy thing on top, and if there's almost no snow, you're going to get a flat white. Really nice use of product, so it's not forced in there. Um, APIs, so that was using a weather API. There are lots of APIs. We should all be talking about APIs and data sources. Um, yeah, weather, great, but we've also got things like artificial intelligence, shopping, we know what people are searching for. We've got council information, and you know, this is a TFL kind of API response, so I can find out about the Bakerloo line. It's telling me there are minor delays. I can use that. Uh, we've seen that in other things. Uh, and if you don't have a live version of that, you can often download big lumps of data as zip files, as sort of, you know, Excel formats, and you can use those locally, often use that. Um, beacons, we've mentioned those. Um, you know, great. Um, the problem with beacons is you do need an app to talk to the beacon. You need, there's a little pairing going on there. If you don't have the app, the beacon's kind of not really that useful, but if you have an app, then great. You walk past the out-of-home screen, this thing can come alive and tell you all about things. Very useful. Um, directional speakers, sound showers, uh, whatever you want to call them. So these are really useful. So piezoelectric speakers give you a cone or actually a beam of sound right underneath whoever it is. Great thing about these is you can actually point them from sort of here to the back. You can track somebody going along. You can make them think they're hearing things because they can't. Nobody else can hear it. Only they can hear it. Really useful, you know, it creates a little bit of pizzazz, a bit of theatre behind, sort of out of home. Special builds, love a special build, who doesn't? But, you know, obviously limited reach, but it's, as we've known, it's about the YouTube video you get out of it, pretty much. So this was a uh, you know, really nice example. Um, some motion detectors that stick out the side of a billboard. When the billboard, uh, the train comes along, the billboard then switches to another piece of linear content, really. But really subtle, really nice use of uh, a special build. Uh, another, you know, using live, you're seeing a lot of YouTube live video, Facebook live video, Periscope coming onto the market um, and gaining some traction. So this is a, a Zurich uh, train station using a, a live billboard, and we've seen it with a doctor and things like that. So, you know, interesting how bandwidth is allowing live video to come through into out of home as well. And um, this is one we were involved in. Uh, I've got Gon here who actually programmed it. So this was using cameras. This, the genesis of this one, if you didn't know, was... Uh, us saying, what's the, what's the lumpy thing on the top of the screens? They said, it's a camera, what can it do? And is really using technology as the genesis for the idea, really. So this used uh, facial recognition to figure out when people are actually looking at the ads and then doing something dynamic. Uh, so now we're going to the near future. So this is stuff that's happening elsewhere, but we probably haven't really integrated hugely into out of home. Some does, um, but not a lot does at the moment. So we've got things like 360 degree video we're seeing on uh, Facebook. Uh, and uh, YouTube natively. So this is, you know, interactive. This is me actually looking around. So, you know, how can we use that? Can we connect to the screen? Can we look around? Can we use it for tourism? Um, those sorts of things. Not really using that at the moment. Um, IBM Watson, we hear a lot about artificial intelligence and how can we use, uh, you know, sort of more sort of semantic lookup of things and how can we actually base big sort of uh, crowdsourced uh, studies um, where do we get that data from? Well, IBM have got some services that are pay-as-you-go, really. You, you go onto the website, and you can do all sorts of things. You can literally go on there now, uh, upload an image, and it'll tell you what's in that image. It'll give you a text file about what's in there. Likewise, you can send it a tweet, or you can send it any sort of text, and it'll, it'll give you a, a sort of, an, and it'll analyze the, the, sort of the, the language of it, whether it's angry, or whether it's passive, or whatever it is, or humorous. So really interesting when you've got a dynamic campaign, people are interacting with it, you can get a sense of what people are actually feeling about it. Uh, likewise, you can then take it that one step further and sort of hook into lots of social media and get sort of personality insights out of people. Lots of things you can do. This is only a, a sort of six out of probably about 15 things they've given you access to of their artificial intelligence platform. So you don't have to build it, essentially. Um, GeoWave is, uh, Ripple is quite an interesting one. So this sits in an app. So if you're a developer, you have an app already. You're a publisher, great. 
Um, this sits in, there's a little bit of code that just pings the GPS position of the handset. Uh, and what Ripple do is they keep that, they keep a historical um, uh, record of that. So, uh, which is great, uh, you know, obviously you've signed up to it in your terms and conditions and clearly you all read that when you install the app. Um, however, what it allows you to do as an advertiser is you can say, could you tell me every handset that has been in three different football grounds in London in the last year? Okay, if it does, I'd like to send them a message, please. So you can use that for anything. You can say, give me anybody who's been at three points up the M1 and they've gone to, I don't know, Reading. Uh, when they go off at Reading Station, I'd like to hit them with an offer. So that's quite interesting how you can have geo-aware. So if you know you've got three locations where you need to be talking to somebody, you can then start talking to them directly through their phone and bring their attention to screens elsewhere. Uh, so this is us right now. Um, so on that sort of geo-fencing, which is allowing people to interact with physical spaces, um, I've drawn a big box around BAFTA, and unfortunately they didn't allow it, but what you could do is something like Snapchat. So if somebody stood outside your, your banner or you've said something on your screen that says, please interact with me, um, if they're using Snapchat, then if they're in this square and they go to their Snapchat and they can pull these little filters across the screen, you can actually have your content overlaid on their pictures. Um, really used a good effect with the Trump when he didn't turn up, Donald Trump when he didn't turn up to the, uh, the big sort of debate. Um, so somebody drew a big geofence around his conference. So when people were Snapchatting in there, they went, well, where are you, basically? Um, so, you know, almost you have to think of a rearguard action. How do you defend your campaigns against people doing this to you? Uh, something to think about. Um, brilliantly intro before, so I don't really have to go into it, but um, hyper-local Wi-Fi networks is kind of how I've been selling them because it sounds cool. Um, but, you know, the beauty of this is you can put this on top of Everest. You can put it on the tube, you can put it in your backpack, you stick a USB kind of charger in it and it'll last for a week. So, you know, if you want to make ad shells really interesting and have a, you know, have a, a video in them uh, that you can actually take away on your phone, uh, this is what this little box does. So that's kind of cool. Um, I think we've got Gordon here today. Uh, so I've had the pleasure of making one of the games uh, for Captive Media. So, you know, looking at where other screens are, quite literally, you're, you're, you're captive at this point. Um, and it uses, it's very clever, um, as Gordon will tell you. It uses kind of three beams that come out of here. Um, so it's retrofitted to your rhinals. Uh, you don't have to buy a whole new thing. And obviously your, your, your Wii will then essentially is three left, right, and center button presses. Uh, so you can do things like votes. Uh, there was a vote last week. Uh, I think it was on the European Brexit referendum or something like that. Who should play for England? Yeah. What was that? Who should play for England? Oh, who should play for England, that's right. So you can, you know, you can get uh, quite interesting data out of these things. Uh, we keep hearing a lot about VR, but it's very experiential, and it's also very solitary at the moment. Um, so this was just, a, I thought this was a very simple way of giving that next bit. Virtual reality is great, the V is virtual, but really it's just visual. Um, there's no other senses. So it's very simple, if you put a plank on the floor and tell somebody they're in a plank above, the, all they can do is they can feel the edges of the plank and, they get, and it just brings it into a next kind of level of reality. Whereas if this is all on the screen, everybody's going, look at that person on the plank over there. And then on the screen is you see what they see. Everybody would want to go and get involved in it. Um, so we're seeing sort of VR uh, coming into uh, sort of bigger experiences rather than just people in bedrooms in their pants. Um, Star Wars, uh, this was a really nice sort of type with Google and Star Wars. And this is connecting your phone to a big screen. So uh, you would use your phone as the accelerometer thing. So you would connect your phone to your computer. And as you swished your phone around, it became the lightsaber on the screen. And you had to sort of defend yourself against the, the laser bolts from the, uh, the stormtroopers. And the second brilliant thing about that is this is all rendered in HTML. So this is WebGL. So this is in a browser on your phone or on a desktop. There's no sort of, there's no flash. There's no all sort of weird stuff. This is all just in a browser. So this is now available realistically on a, on a banner as well. And then finally, we've already seen this as well, so contactless payments. So you've got people like Square or iZettle, which are allowing actual activation of your, your contactless. So you can get 30 quid off one of these without actually having any sort of um, payments or issues whatsoever. So great for charities, as we've seen. But, you know, if that's integrated into ad shells like we some, sometimes see as NFC, then, you know, that's a, that's a great next step. So now we go into the next bit, which is sort of stuff that's a little bit illegal or a little bit sort of morally corrupt, um, but, you know, with the right sort of uh, country to do it in, <laughs> if you don't have the same laws, uh, you might get some of this away as well. So uh, this is totally legal and totally awesome as well. So this is uh, Pix and I. So Pix and I, what they do is they, the premise is uh, what better way of getting a, a snapshot of your personality. And a lot of out-of-home media is all about how do you make it personal, because it's, it's a relatively impersonal thing. So a lot of this is how can you get a good read on somebody. So what they do is uh, they go through your photos on your phone. 
Um, they give, you give it permission, dives through your photos, looks at all your photos. It goes, oh, you're into motorbikes. Uh, you're into, I think it might even tell us, here we go. Uh, you're into motorbikes, you're into nature, you're into sun. Okay, brilliant, you're into holidays. So therefore what it'll do is you'll think, well, that's kind of creepy. It's going to send that to an advertiser. It doesn't do that. It just sits at the top of the app that it's in and says, if an advert comes in that isn't related to motorbikes or sun or dogs or nature or whatever it is, don't let it through. Give me a better one. Give me a better one until it's relevant for the person you're advertising to. So this is kind of interesting. If everybody's walking around with this sort of ID of their personality in their phone and can communicate it to a screen, you've got a really good read of who's actually around you and you should tailor your content to them. Uh, Moody's, download it now. It's on the App Store. It's great. So this is using, um, we mentioned sort of text lookup of what the personality traits are. So this is actually a, uh, an audio version of it. So if you played a Donald Trump uh, speech, this is kind of what it will say. Every 20 seconds, it gives you a read of the emotional content of the speech. So it's really interesting. If you, you can listen to people who are walking past banners or, or are making calls on the phone or something like that, then you can actually find out the, sort of the emotion of the room or the emotion of the area that you're, you're within. I mean, clearly it's illegal to listen into people's conversations, but, you know, interesting. How can I make my, uh, my ads more specific? Uh, Wi-Fi alert. Uh, this is Wi-Fi aware. This is sort of, I'm not really sure where this is in ratification or whether it's coming in or not, but this is kind of where Bluetooth was 10 years ago, which was, oh, you walk into a cinema and it, bing, stuff appears on your phone and you go, yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. I really want to look at that ad. So this is sort of active advertising to you, whereas Wi-Fi at the moment is you log on, you say you want it, you don't do the password, and then you're connected. Well, if you've allowed Wi-Fi uh, aware, this new standard coming out, um, possibly, and then it'd be far more passive than that. You can actually just walk up and it'll go, bing, oh, there's a thing. So it's basically beacons, but using Wi-Fi. And it allows you also to connect two people together. Say you're playing Candy Crush. Two people can play multiplayer Candy Crush in a tube because it's just local Wi-Fi. So it's quite interesting if your banners are now you know, activated with uh, Wi-Fi aware. That's quite an interesting way of drawing attention or adding extra services. Um, again, I mentioned virtual reality. Um, and one of the realities that is missing is touch. So uh, haptic feedback is a kind of a cool word we've been using for a couple of years now. I love this one because it's good. <laughs> um, but what this is, is this is Disney Labs. Disney Labs got some great stuff, by the way. Just always check them out. Um, so this is allowing uh, somebody, <laughs> larking around a bit nerdily, but um, when they're sort of hitting balls, it's tracking the, the, their hands, and it knows when the hand has hit a ball, and it projects a little puff of air onto their hand. Um, so they can feel the ball uh, when they've hit it. So it gives them some sort of tactile feedback. Um, roadside obviously doesn't really uh, escape either. So um, we're doing some interesting roadside things at the moment. And it's quite restrictive what you can do. However, I did get into a little bit of a rabbit hole about what connected cars are actually producing as far as data and how can we make roadside a little bit more relevant. So um, there's a, an argument about who owns the data. Should it be a car manufacturer? Should it be you? Should it be public? Should it be not? Should it be private? Um, however, you know, connected cars, they know where your journey starts, where it stops. They know when your oil service is due. They know, how, you know where you park up. Uh, they know what speed you're doing, incidentally. So you can extrapolate from this data and get a good sort of complete UK uh, uh, picture of how fast cars are driving. And likewise, if we know somebody comes from Essex to Kent, um, we can put an ad right in the middle of them. We can say, hey, you know, how's it going in, in Essex this morning or whatever. Likewise, we know when you're going from work and to home. Um, but in the future, we probably will be driving automated. This is a really terrible patent application. Um, this is for automated cars. And clearly, when you're in an automated car, you won't be really looking at the road anymore. You'll be looking for something else. You've got your phone. You've got your tablet. So this is Ford's uh, first patent for in-car entertainment. And it's just basically a pull-down screen with a projector on it. It's terrible. Uh, however, it's really interesting about a new out-of-home screen opening up is in uh, automated vehicles when, you, you know, that's now spewing out lots of data and it's all very uh, contextual to where you are. Speaking of which, if you've got a telephone, which I guess everybody's got a phone on them today, I call it a telephone, that's weird, um, then your phone is tracking this unless you've turned it off specifically. So um, if you've got a Google handset, then it's tracking this. If you've got Apple, it's doing exactly the same. So every couple of uh, miles, every couple of minutes, it's tracking a dot, and it's storing all that in the servers in the sky. You can go and download it. It's all freely available. They're not being creepy about it, but they're semi-creepy. Um, but what it'll do is it'll say, well, if you've gone down this road and you've left these little dots, um, you're going pretty quickly there. It'll actually then start to do a hypothesis of what it thinks you're doing. It knows whether you're on public transport. Oh, there are a lot of handsets traveling with you at the same speed, in which case you're probably on public transport, probably on a bus, because they can actually detect it. 
Um, if you're on your own, but you're doing about 15 miles an hour, you're probably on a bike. So there's all that data that it automatically puts onto this. So it, what it also does, it says that if you leave somewhere in the morning and you go somewhere for about seven hours, that's probably work. And if you leave somewhere at about six o'clock and you go somewhere and you spend all night there, that's probably home. So it automatically knows whether you're at home or at work or traveling in between. So if it wants to advertise on Google, clearly um, they might or might not have an advertising network, you might have noticed. They know when you're on your way home. They're not going to advertise a pizza on the way into work, but they probably are going to advertise a pizza on the way home. Uh, they also own Nest as well, so they know what rooms you're in in your house if you have their fire alarms, just FYI. So public Wi-Fi scanning, this is quite interesting. This has been buttoned down in the last uh, months, years, um, but there's still two ways of doing Wi-Fi scanning. Your phone, when you go to your little uh, what Wi-Fi networks are in the room, has a list. Now, the reason that list is there is because your phone has talked to all the networks or all the, the Wi-Fi boxes. So if I can get a list of all these, they know about me, I know about them. So my phone has said, hi, I'm here, this is me, I'm a unique number, uh, and I turn up tomorrow, still the same number, I turn up the next day, I'm still the same number, that little Wi-Fi box is going, you know, that handset, I've seen it three days in a row, that's interesting, maybe I should be doing something with that. Um, I've seen to get in a lot of people, they're all the same people every day, what should my ad say if I can actually then use this relatively passive data, um, let alone if I go through the full authentication, the five steps of Wi-Fi, I won't even go into that because it's quite dull, but there's some quite interesting things happen there. Um, Wi-Fi triangulation is the next step. So StoreSense, they have a whole load of uh, Wi-Fi transmitters or Wi-Fi boxes around a store, and they can use that as triangulation like GPS does. As long as they've got enough of these boxes and your handset is there pinging to all of them, it can then figure out where exactly your handset is in a store. So as you're coming through, completely passive, you're not signed up for it, um, you know, it doesn't really impinge on your civil liberties, but they know exactly where you've been in the store. If you've walked up and down the beer aisle, and it knows you've walked up and down the beer aisle 15 minutes, and they know when you turn up at the checkout, and they can check your receipt, and you didn't buy any beer, maybe there's something different. Maybe there's some advertising they need to do, or maybe they need to move the beer. So that's quite interesting. Um, but that's relatively invasive, and this one I, I think is brilliant. Hox and Analytics will do shoe tracking. So what they'll do is they'll do these little devices going into a public space or a building, uh, and they look at shoes. So if there's a big shoe, it's probably an adult. If it's a small shoe, it's probably a child. If it's a brogue, it's probably a man, uh, probably a relatively well-off man. If it's a trainer, it's probably somebody younger. If it's a high heel, it's probably a woman. You know, so they can give you some quite interesting analytics uh, just from looking at shoes. Um, and families will turn up. So they'll say, there's a family turned up. We've spot them three times. They've all been together. That's a family. Um, and they can then sort of, um, that's 80% accurate, by the way. So without doing anything, Imagine this at the beginning of uh, Leicester Square on all the exits for Leicester Square. They knew who's in there, who's out of Leicester Square. So they can then start tailoring the advertising to, oh, look, it's all full of women today. Or, oh, look, it's all full of men. And then we get to the interesting stuff. So hopefully I've got enough time for this. So this is Neo. So this is, uh, I couldn't think of another N-word for the future. So uh, this is Neo. Uh, red pill, blue pill, how far do you want to go down the rabbit hole? This gets a little bit interesting. So this is happening right now. So I thought I'd start off quite quite sort of steadily, really. So this is dynamic replacement of content within ads. So this is happening now. You don't really see a huge amount of it, but you know this can happen real time. So if I'm uh, in Sweden, I want to see a Volvo car in that car park. Uh, if I'm in America, I might want to see a, I don't know, a, a Buick or a Chrysler or something like that. So that's happening, so that's good. Um, your face is actually quite a good commodity right now. If I knew what you looked like, I can find out quite a lot about you to personalize any sort of advertising. And of course, we all have faces, most of us. So uh, this is a Russian artist who did a, a quite an interesting art piece where he took people on the tube and used this app. Uh, I recommend you try and download it because it's all in Russian. It's really scary. Um, but try and download it. It finds you on uh, social media and finds your profile. So from your face, I can then find out who you are, what your name is, and then from that point on, I can read your social profile and know exactly what you're up uh, into. So I can advertise to you, and that's just from your face. This is haptic feedback. This is ultrasonics. This is really exciting. So when you, when you walk past a speaker in a nightclub, obviously you've all been to one of those in the last couple of weeks, um, your hair sort of blows away because you can feel the actual force coming from the speaker. This uses tiny, tiny speakers, ultrasonic speakers in an array, and they can focus those onto a little point in space where you can actually feel it, and it's a static point. So if you've got virtual reality glasses on, you can now actually create a full kind of 3D thing in midair that you can't really, you can't see it, but you can feel it and touch it. So imagine this coming out of a billboard where you can touch a product, you can feel a product, you know, or you can feel the force of something. Uh, that's kind of interesting. What is somebody thinking? That'd be really lovely to know, wouldn't it? If somebody sees your ad and you can actually know what they're thinking. So this is a little bit way beyond this because you need to actually open up the skull and put some electrodes on the top of the actual brain itself. <laughs> However, 
if you read the e, uh, ECG signals, you can turn those into phonetic signals, which you can turn back into text. So that's kind of interesting. If somebody's thinking, oh, I'm not, I'm not really sure about that, and it comes, I'm not really sure about that, then what do you do with your, your ad? Um, but likewise, you know, if you're staying there at a, a, you know, your PIN number, I can guarantee when you type your PIN number in, you're thinking about those numbers. If somebody's there, you know, this is right now, right at the end, but you can do those cranial caps that are on the surface. You know, what about if it was three inches away, six inches away, a foot away? Somebody would go, I know exactly what you're thinking. You know, that's only a matter of time. Um, uh, if you want to come up to me later, I will scan your uh, contactless card and get your credit card number, your expiry date. I'll get your issuer type uh, and also how many pin tries you've got left. I'll do that straight away from my Android phone. If you want to try it yourself, download this now. It's all publicly available. I could be stood behind you on the tube and I can just do that on your pocket or your purse. Uh, it even works with uh, iPhones as well. I can actually read the numbers off the iPhone. Um, some even have transaction data on the card. I can read that as well. So that's kind of interesting that I can then have a, well, okay, you've got a Visa card, you've got an um, American Express, probably a business person. That's interesting. What can I know about that? Um, now, talking about sort of tracking people, so even your wearables are giving you away a little bit. Um, so this was a really interesting experiment to try and, uh, try and sort of crack into people's passwords just by using their, their wristwatch. So... If, if you can sort of know that you're doing this, and the prevalent is like the letter E is the most prevalent, that's what they do is they center around the E, and they can spot where your hands are going just through the accelerometers in your wrist. And therefore, they've got a really good guess on where you're actually typing your password. Um, but imagine this in a, in a you know, you've got a, you've got a, you're carrying a bag, you're carrying a coffee, you know, you're waving to somebody. They've got all those sorts of gestures available to you if you can just hack into them. Um, so, now this is lovely as well. So this is, you know, holograms. Everyone wants a hologram, right? So this is an actual hologram. This is actually working. So this is using femtosecond lasers, very, very short wavelength lasers. And what they can do is they can focus them. And when they focus them, they've got so much energy in them, they can actually sort of fuse the air into sort of a piece of plasma. Um, so it's just tiny, tiny at the moment. Um, but it's a touchable plasma hologram. Um, so if we can start doing these, there's only a few dots you can have, but imagine like loads and loads of dots, we can start building, you know, help me Obi-Wan, you're my only hope kind of thing. We can build those now, um, but that's not going to hurt you. Um, the next one will hurt you if you get in the way of it. So this, this car that just so happens to be parked here has got all sorts of massive lasers in it, cooling fans and everything. And what this is doing is it's firing super high power lasers and it's ionizing air in dots in the air. So this is, when you hear this, it's going and if you walked inside of that, it would just fry you. However, um, holograms, they're kind of, we're kind of getting there. Imagine if that can render a product. Uh, six minutes, cool, I can slow down a little bit. So this one, uh, we've got about four left to go, and they get weirder. Now, this one is one, possibly one of my all-time favorites. So this is taking uh, an optical cortex uh, read from outside the brain on, on, on the skin's surface. So this is somebody is watching this clip, and this is what the computer is piecing together that somebody is watching just from the activity of their optical cortex on the outside of their head. So depending on what you're seeing, or quite frankly what you're thinking, if you close your eyes, you're still using your optical cortex to process those images. More, moreover, if you're dreaming, you can now record what's going through your optical cortex onto film. So um, see me afterwards if you want to know how this is done, but it's really interesting, you know, how can we do this uh, and not start recording dreams and selling them and you know, monetizing what you're actually, what you're imagining. So if somebody says, you know, imagine the most perfect holiday in the world and we will be able to hook you up with, you know, the flights, then as soon as you close your eyes and start remembering things, we can start doing this sort of thing. And this is about three years ago as well, so they've come on since then. This, this is already out there, so this is uh, listen to music with these headphones on, and it will stimulate the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve gives you a little bit of a sort of euphoric moment. Um, I think it runs down the back of the neck, so I'm not quite sure how they get there, but... Um, interesting. So I can make you feel something slightly different when you listen to some of my content. Um, so I'm not quite sure how we'd get to there from an out-of-home media. That was slightly creepy, but um, it's worth a try. But memory manipulation is, is, is where some of it is at. So they've done this in, in mice, and the way this works, again, it's a little bit invasive in that we need to um, put, uh, we need to dye uh, neurons uh, uh, with a photo sort of receptive dye, and then we need to basically put them in your brain. Uh, and then we need to put little lights on those neurons. And what we can do is we know where the memories are for certain things. If we flash lights at them really quickly, we can suppress the memory. And if we flash them in a different way, we can actually bring back the memories. So what we can actually do is implant memories. And DARPA, American uh, defense research place in, in America, um, they're, they're doing experiments on this where they, they've actually found that a rat that they trained to do something quite tricky, uh, they can actually then put that memory from that rat into another rat who's never done it, and the other rat gets it instantly. 
So, you know, we're talking about the Matrix, and when you want to learn Kung Fu, this is kind of that I want to learn Kung Fu moment. Uh, likewise, if you're in an Apache helicopter uh, and you need to then go into a Lynx helicopter, they, they can download that militarily over the internet and you can learn, but you kind of need to have your brain uh, opened up to get that to happen. But, you know, so this is what, kind of where my journey started. I was sat on a, uh, a plane probably about 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and now this, this is really, really interesting. So what this is, is um, a camera in your eye, it goes through to this little box and then goes straight into your optical cortex. So you won't need eyes anymore, which hence the, the title of my um, uh, talk. So what this really means is you don't really need real eyes anymore. So if you go into the army in a couple of years' time, they'll probably take out your crappy organic one-time zoom, you know, fallible eyes, and they'll give you the, the kind of the cool night vision, friend or foe enabled, ten times zoom eye. Uh, and therefore, what this really does is it then sort of questions what goes into your eye is not real reality anymore. We can detect what goes into your eye. So, we don't, you know, ads, well, great. You know, we can actually give you, like the Spotify moments, we can give you the super cool eye for free. Um, we'll upgrade it every two years, as long as just before you go to bed, we kind of run a few ads on it. Um, <laughs> likewise, when you're looking at out-of-home media, you can then sort of... Uh, this is this is 20-year-old kit. Um, so... You know, you see on, on the YouTube, you see kids having their cochlear implant, implants kind of uh, activated for the first time. It's a marvellous thing. Uh, there is actually a little bit of video. It's not kind of looping properly, but there's a chap who has a camera stuck on his eye. Um, clinically blind, but he can actually drive a car as long as they painted white lines at the side of it. So it works, and that was 20 years ago. Uh, Microsoft HoloLens, I have to mention this because it's amazing. So this is this chap's daughter. She's in a room, and it's, she's been scanned real time at 60, 30 frames a second, whatever it is. She's been scanned as a 3D model, and because we're wearing the glasses on the camera, we're seeing what he's seeing. So we're now augmenting her into his reality. So she's somewhere else. Um, she's got a stool as well, as you can see. So when she sits on the stool, so if you went like that, it'd go straight through. It'd be slightly, slightly funky. Um, but we can now do teleporting, really. So teleconferencing is one of those things. But we can then see products. We can then see cars. We can get into them. We can you know, walk around them. Um, so that's using augmented reality. So we can actually see what we're doing. It's not virtual reality, which is completely enclosed. Uh, I had to mention this one, because this could kind of revolutionize out-of-home media, um, possibly in a good way, possibly in a bad way. So this was a student's kind of hack day. They put on virtual reality glasses and showed. And what they did is they dynamically blocked out ads. So if, you didn't want, if they didn't want you to see an ad, they could fuzz it out. So it's a real life ad blocker. So if you imagine you've now got augmented eyes with dynamic in inputs into it, it's up to me to decide what you see. And likewise, I don't really need an out, out of home banner anymore. All I need is a space to project it onto, or not even that. So, you know, it's the, it's the end of out of home media, clearly. Um, however, you know, this is really interesting. It's up to me to decide what you see and where you see it. Um, and likewise, it's up to me as a user. To define that. So we've gone through the now, the near, the next, and the neo. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of scary, but the good news is, don't panic. One more uh, movie reference, uh, one of my favourite books ever. Um, you can buy one of these. So this is a foil hoodie. Uh, if you're extra large, it's $160, but it's a hoodie uh, that contains foil, so nobody can read your your thoughts. So uh, if you want that, I'll, g I'll give you a link. And it's, there's some science here, so it must be true. Um, there you have it. <laughs>